I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar. Thank you for participating in this installment of the Allegheny Conference Response and Recovery Webinar Series. Today we are joined by Pennsylvania Department of Labor and Industry Secretary Jerry Oleksiak, k and Gates partner Mike Pavlik, and Reed Smith partner Jay Glunt. During these uncertain and unprecedented times, the Allegheny Conference is focused on understanding the needs of regional investors, partners, economic development agencies, region-wide, and the business community at large in responding in real time with relevant and timely information. Continuing with the tradition of the Allegheny Conference, we are convening partners from public and private sector uh, areas to bring experts to the table so that we can deliver high quality information. We're using all of our platforms, web, social media, email, webinars, to bring our community together and you the resources that will move this region forward unified and together. Our series has included a discussion on legal changes based on the new Federal CARES Act and its impact on unemployment and family medical leave, as well as a two-part series specifically geared towards small businesses and how phase three provided valuable resources to help them survive in these tough times. Just last week, we spoke with PA Attorney General Josh Shapiro to discuss the PA care package and his office's efforts to combat price gouging. Yesterday, we were excited to bring Neil Bradley, the Executive Vice President and Chief Policy Officer of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce uh, into our series to update us on the Federal CARES Act. Recordings for all these webinars uh, can be found online at www.alleganyconference.org backslash COVID-19. Today, we will take an in-depth look at the most up-to-date information related to the federal pandemic emergency unemployment compensation and pandemic unemployment assistance and the impact on the business community and our entire community. On behalf of the Allegheny Conference and affiliated organizations, the Greater Pittsburgh Chamber of Commerce, the Pittsburgh Regional Alliance, the Pennsylvania Economy League of Greater Pittsburgh, we would like to thank our sponsors, Peoples, Giant Eagle, Highmark, and UPMC Health Plan. Their contributions make today's programming possible, and we are forever grateful for their contribution to ensuring that up-to-date information is provided during this tough time. I'd like to welcome Pennsylvania Department of Labor and Industry Secretary Jerry Oleksiak and his staff uh, to join us. Uh, partner at k &L Gates, Jay Glunt will be on the line, as well as uh, Mike Pavlik, and they're gonna answer questions for you today. Their presentations will be followed by a question and answer period, which I will moderate. So please feel free to submit your questions through this presentation uh, platform, and we will get to as many as we are able to do today. Please keep your questions succinct, and if you can, direct them to the proper person you'd like to ask that question to. So with that, let me hand it over to PA Department of Labor and Industry Secretary, Jerry Alexiak. Secretary? Thank you, Larry, and uh, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, I want to thank by starting all of uh, Pennsylvania's, or start by thanking all of Pennsylvania's first responders who are uh, helping us all through this crisis. And I also want to thank the staff at Labor and Industry, 4,000 people who have adjusted very quickly to what is unfortunately right now a new normal for us in working with the, uh, the pandemic. Um, let me pro I want to provide a little bit of context and leave as much of time for questions as possible. And I am joined today by our um, Deputy Secretary for Unemployment Compensation, Bill Trusky. So after I talk, if that's okay, Larry, we'll let Bill say a few things and then we'll be available to answer questions. Uh, a, a few weeks before the governor's uh, mitigation efforts went into effect, we realized that something different was coming, something was happening. And we started in our uh, agency uh, 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 COVID-19 task force uh, that was meeting daily. We started regular updates and planning with our uh, leadership team. And the uh, directive I gave them was, what, what will, if we got a call today that the Capitol complex was closed, are we ready? And to a large degree, we had emergency plans in place, but we had to update those. And we spent a lot of time getting ready for when that uh, order did come. And we've done a lot to uh, get our, um, our uh, staff, particularly our UC staff that we'll focus on today, uh, working from home. We, um, we've been in regular contact since this happened with the Department of Labor and Industry, uh, getting updates from them. We have been in regular contact, obviously, with the governor's office, 
And we've done a lot to uh, increase our capacity and Bill can talk more about that. But just to, again, to put it in some context, in the three weeks before the mitigation efforts began, we had a total of about 40,000 new uh, initial unemployment claims. In less than two weeks after the mitigation effort, we had over a million. So we went basically from record low numbers to record high numbers within a matter of a few days. Uh, our team has responded effectively, but we know that people are still frustrated. People are still having difficulties getting through uh, at times or uh, getting questions answered. Um, but we have, we have, as of this morning, had uh, almost 1.4 million claims and we've been able to get out almost $800 million in uh, benefits to new and existing claims. Um, and I'll let Bill, uh, if you wanna talk about some of the uh, things we've done to uh, respond, I'd be happy to, to turn it over to you right now. Sure, thanks, Mr. Secretary. Uh, and thanks for the opportunity to be with the Pittsburgh Chamber. Uh, my wife's from Pittsburgh and uh, we missed our first Easter out, out your way in quite some time. But as, as Jerry said, uh, you know, overnight we went from lowest unemployment in history to, to highest. Um, and needless to say, that's a, a big change. I mean, we were staffed for low unemployment. Um, so we started to pivot um, the Friday before, even the week before um, St. Patty's Day. We've added uh, 70 annuitants this week to our staff. Um, I'm in discussions right now to take 100 people from the Department of Revenue. We have uh, an application out there for 100 intermediate intake interviews. As of yesterday, we already had 1,800 applications. Um, we're not going to have trouble finding people to help us out. Our folks are working seven days a week, up to 12 hours a day right now. Next week, we're going to even increase the overtime. The overtime is voluntary. We don't want to burn out our staff. Uh, so we, you know, we're trying to manage that with, with, they're on the phones. And as you can imagine, being on the phones with uh, some angry constituency, nobody's calling to say hello. Everybody wants to know where their money's, money is. Um, but needless to say, that's what we're doing on the staffing end. Uh, we've started to implement the Federal CARES Act program. The first one we implemented was FPUC, which is the $600 weekly benefit. That should start hitting our first group of claimants today and tomorrow. Um, our next one that um, has tons of in interest is the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance, the PUA program. We hope to be able to have an application on our website within the next couple of days. We are working with our modernization vendor to develop that website, and it's been going very well. Um, every state has been in the same situation. First, we had to wait for the federal guidance, which we received two Sundays ago at about 9 o'clock at night on this program. Uh, our t IT folks have been working with the vendor tirelessly, and again, we hope to have that application up within the next couple of days. The next one is the pandemic emergency unemployment compensation. We just got guidance on this program Sunday night and are currently in development with our IT folks. After the PUA program goes live, we will start implementing the PEUC program. And then the last guidance we are waiting for and still do not have is the 50% reimbursement uh, for reimbursable employers, uh, so and even for the, um, excuse me, for our nonprofits, our government entities, our churches, we're we're waiting for guidance on who that program is going to uh, encompass. Um, Jerry, I'll turn it back to you. Uh, thank you. Uh, we'll be ready for questions. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, Jerry. Now we will hear from. Thank you, Jerry. And we'll now we'll hear from Mike Pavlik. Mike uh, serves as a partner at KNL Gates and will fill us in on a lot of the things that are going on over there. Mike. Uh, Larry, thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon to everybody. Um, uh, my topic today, um, which I would like to cover in about 10 minutes to leave plenty of time for questions, um, are leaves, reductions, furloughs, and layoffs, okay? Um, so we've been, <laughs> we've been inundated with, uh, with a lot of stuff. Um, 
it's caused a bunch of headaches for, uh, for everybody um, from employers to their employees, um, to uh, government officials and, and to everyone's pets as well. Um, if you could flip. What I'd like to remind you about are some leave entitlements. Um, the old FMLA, and I use the word term old, it's the, it's the existing FMLA continues to apply. Um, COVID-19 is a serious health condition. Um, and a reminder that old FMLA is still unpaid. Uh, I wanna remind you about the Pittsburgh paid sick days law. Um, so for those of you who have employees in the city of Pittsburgh, that became effective the middle of last month. And that provides up to five paid sick days um, it depends upon how you chose to, to accrue. Uh, some employers chose to front load those days um, and those employees um, have the ability to use those days for COVID-19. Um, and in fact, the employer's ability to vet reasons for the use is fairly minimal. So if the employee tells you that they want to take it for COVID-19, um, you don't have a heck of a lot of choice there. Um, other employers uh, have accrued. Uh, in other words, they're accruing at one hour for every 35 hours worked. Um, and needless to say, um, there will probably be very few paid sick days available at least right away, but they will become available over time. Um, and then the big piece of COVID-19 legislation, which everybody is struggling to wrap their brains around at times is the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. Um, and, and the way I've sort of structured this presentation, it's designed to answer questions that I've been getting um, on a fairly frequent level. Um, and one of the first questions is, well, who the heck does this apply to? Um, and it's clear, it applies to companies who have fewer than 500 employees. If you are a big company, you are not subject to Families First Coronavirus Response Act. And then I get inquiries from smaller companies saying, yeah, but I've got a a, a subsidiary corporation or a sister corporation affiliate. And if you combine us, we're well over 500 employees. Do I have to follow? And the test there is the FMLA's integrated employer test. The key consideration is whether labor relations are integrated. Um, and I'm gonna ask you, or I'm gonna tell you uh, the same thing that I ask all the clients that ask me that question. You may want to be combined with that larger employer now, but do you really wanna be combined with that larger employer later? Are you taking a position that could cause you um, undue hardship, so to speak, um, in order to avoid this act? And let me give you a very simple example. If you are not subject to FMLA now, um, your, sister your sister corporation is subject, you combine the two of you, now you're subject, okay? Um, or at least that would be the argument. Um, and all to avoid the effect of, uh, or the impact of this, of this leave act. So be careful. Um, uh, if you're looking at possibly combining to, to total yourself over 500, ask yourself, what are the long-term consequences for doing so? Not just the short-term consequences. Everybody's calling the two leave programs under Families First different things. Um, so I'm gonna use my terminology. Um, so bear with me. Um, the first of those is the public health emergency leave. And this is the new paid FMLA. Um, and again, uh, we're, you're gonna see it initialized as P-H-E-L. Uh, and then the second is the emergency paid sick leave. And that's a, sort of a new program entirely, uh, independent um, of basically anything else. Uh, so those are the two things. What I'd like to do, Larry, if you could flip, let's talk very briefly about each of those. Um, let's talk about EPSL first, which is the emergency paid sick leave. Uh, a reminder that uh, full-time employees are eligible to receive up to 80 hours of paid leave if the employee is one of these things, okay? There are six, uh, six uh, criteria identified there. The employee has to meet one of those criteria in order to be eligible, okay? If they don't meet one of those criteria, they are not eligible and this new paid leave should not be granted to them. If you want the tax credit, you've got to make sure that you give the leave for the correct and proper reasons. Um, so if you could flip again, Larry. Let me just briefly address some other questions that I get under EPSL. Um, what about part-time employees? Well, they're covered. Uh, they're covered under P EPSL. They're entitled to leave. It's a prorated leave. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an amount of leave entitled, uh, or it's amount of leave equal to the average number of hours worked over a two-week period, um, typically the last two-week period. Um, uh, before, before all this started happening. 
Um, the EPSL may only be taken in full day increments um, and is continuous uh, until the leave is either qualifying uh, or the leave is, or the qualifying conditional no longer exists or the employee is out of, is out of the leave, okay? Um, in other words, the concept of intermittent leave really doesn't apply to EPSL. Uh, I note here that there are in question marks exceptions for child care and telework. Um, let me explain what those exceptions are. The employer and the employee can agree to make EPSL, at EPSL the equivalent of intermittent leave um, if they so choose to do so. They don't have to do so though, all right? Um, the EPSL sunsets at the end of the year. Uh, it can be used until then. Uh, it does not carry over and it is not payable uh, upon termination. I also want to remind uh, companies about the reasonable accommodation requirements under the ADA, um, which, may be, which may include extended leave if that leave is finite in nature and designed to get the employee back to work, um, as well as LTD policies and short-term disability policies that might be applicable. Keep those in mind. Don't forget those. Larry, if you could flip. Um, for leave taken for an employee's own condition, EPLS is paid at the rate on the screen. Um, it's up to $511 per hour or $5,100 in the aggregate. All right. Um, there is an exception, though, if the leave is for the substantially similar health condition requirement. Um, and at that point, it's two thirds of the applicable EPSL rate up to $200 per day and 2000 um, in the aggregate. Now for leave taken to care for another individual or, or for childcare reasons, um, the leave is paid uh, again at this $200 or $2,000 or $2,000 in aggregate uh, number. If you could flip. Let me focus now on the public health emergency leave. This is the FMLA component to the leave program, okay? It applies only to childcare. All right, so all those other reasons that we looked at diagnosis with, uh, with, with, with COVID or suspected to have COVID or having to care for someone with COVID doesn't apply here. Uh, this is strictly for child care issues. All right, um, and there is one small exception to if, if necessary to care for a child who has a mental or physical disability um, uh, and uh, is in need of self care because of that disability. If we could flip. Reminder that the first 10 days of PHEL are unpaid, all right? But the employee may elect to substitute PTO, and that includes the EPSL leave for those days if they want to. By the way, the employer can require the employee also to substitute PTO. Um, the remaining 10 weeks of PHL will be paid um, at the rate on the screen, okay? Which is roughly two thirds of the employee's usual pay based on the employer's regular work schedule up to $200 today and a $10,000 total. If we could flip. I wanna remind you again that this is FMLA. So there is a pronounced intersection with FMLA. If an individual has already exhausted their FMLA, okay, on whatever calendar year basis you use, um, they are not eligible for PHEL. Similarly, they're not eligible for all 12 weeks of PHEL if they have used some of their FMLA, they're only entitled to 12 weeks total, whether it's a combination of conventional or old FMLA, as I call it, and PHEL, whether it's all PHEL or whether it's all FMLA, all right? But the bottom line is it's 12 weeks during that 12 month period that you folks use for your purposes. Uh, if you could flip. This is something that doesn't get a whole lot of play, documentation for the tax credit. Um, you've got to have documentation. This wasn't clear uh, even up to maybe a week ago, uh, maybe a week and a half ago as to what, what credits, what documentation was needed to get the tax credit. Um, but it's clear now that you need a signed statement with the employee's name, the dates for which leave is requiring, uh, was required, uh, the COVID-19 COVID qualifies a reason for the leave, uh, a statement, uh, uh, that the employee is unable to work or telework because of the COVID-19 qualifying reason. In addition, depending upon the nature of the reason, if you could flip, Larry, there may, there may be additional documentation required, okay, which may include, uh, for example, in the event of an isolation or quarantine order, the name of the government entity that issued the order, 
Um, if uh, the employee is advised by the healthcare provider to self-quarantine, the name of the healthcare provider who, who advised um, and treated the patient. Uh, if, uh, if caring for an individual subject to a quarantine order or, or advised to self-quarantine, it's again, that same information about who issued the quarantine or isolation order, um, the name of the provider or the name of the provider uh, who advised the individual self-quarantine. And if for child care purposes, the names of the children being cared for um, and, and, uh, and additional information, uh, uh, in particular, the fact um, uh, uh, the name of the, of the school or the child care provider that became closed, um, and then a representation that, in fact, there is no other suitable person available to care for the child. If you could flip. I want to talk very briefly about reductions in hours and wages. Um, some employers are now talking about reducing the work days, or reducing salaries. Um, in very broad strokes, those reductions are permissible. Um, be aware of contract restrictions, though. Okay, so if you have employees who are under some sort of contract, whether it be a collective bargaining agreement or whether it be an individual contract, make sure that those contracts allow you to do that. Um, I can say in the events of a CBA, you would probably have to negotiate that. Um, for non-exempt personnel, the reduction should be prospective and the reduction should not reduce compensation below the minimum wage. For salaried exempt personnel, again, the reduction should be prospective and if the reductions result in a sub-minimum salary, which currently is $684 per week, or $35,568 annually, you should be aware that the formerly exempt employee is now entitled to overtime. So to the extent the employee would work more than 40 hours, you have to pay them overtime on top of that. Um, for reductions uh, in, in salary, um, those salary reductions should not be short-term or seasonal. And by that, I mean they shouldn't be sort of a a one week or two week reaction to business needs or to business consequences. Um, they need to be uh, longer term. Um, they need to be somewhat of a commitment. You're not bound to it forever, um, but they need to be something that is um, uh, not just a short term reaction to the business uh, environment that exists. If you could flip Larry. Um, layoffs and furloughs, let me just say that uh, layoffs and furloughs, those are not legal terms, so to speak. Uh, they do have some practical significance. Um, a layoff often means a loss of employment where the employee may not have an expectation of recall um, and will not be eligible for benefits during the layoff, whereas a furlough often means a loss of employment uh, where the employee does have an expectation for recall and uh, may or may not be continuing on benefits during the furlough. For our purposes, um, layoffs and furloughs are really the same thing though, okay? Um, they trigger the same types of requirements. So if we could flip one more. I wanna briefly mention WARN Act. If you are thinking about terminating employees, be aware of WARN. There is no Pennsylvania mini WARN, okay? But other states, if you have operations, other states may have a mini WARN. But for the federal WARN Act, it requires 60 days advance notice of any layoffs or furloughs. It applies to employers with 100 or more, so you've got to have 100 employees. Um, the closing or the plant or the, or the layoff has to affect 50 or more full-time employees at a single site of employment, all right? So that's at one particular facility. Um, uh, and it has to involve one-third of the workforce, okay? So 100 employees, 50 employees affected, and one-third of the workforce affected. Those are your magic numbers uh, under WARN. Um, and if you could flip to one last slide, um, there are some exceptions to COVID um, that I think you might want to consider in the context of WARN. Um, temporary layoffs, those that are less than six months, do not require notice, although I do note that you will be required to provide notice once it becomes reasonably foreseeable that the layoff will extend beyond six months. Um, a layoff for closing caused by an unforeseeable business circumstance excuses timely notice. Again, notice still has to be given as soon as practicable. Commentators are generally in agreement right now that COVID-19 represents unforeseeable business circumstances, although it is a case-by-case -case analysis. Um, a layoff for closing caused by a natural disaster also does not require timely notice. Um, it is much more unclear whether this exception would apply in this context. And I think I have one more slide, Larry, when I just want to briefly mention this. Um, this ties in uh, with, the, with the secretary and his conversation. Um, uh, I've 
Senator Schumer has described uh, the federal uh, unemployment provisions under CARES Act to be unemployment comp on steroids. Um, and if employers are looking for strategies, it may make sense to lay off lower wage workers um, and allow them to collect benefits that may be close to what they would have made had they continued to be employed. Um, so in other words, the UC benefits, the enhanced UC benefits put, uh, present a potential strategy for short-term layoffs. Um, and so that's what I have for you, uh, a few folks today. Larry, thank you. Thanks so much, Mike. Uh, now we're gonna move to Jay Glunt. Jay is a partner at Reed Smith. Um, and Jay is gonna talk a little bit more about the employment side of things in terms of access to the workplace, ADA privacy concerns, and employee screening. So without further ado, Jay Glunt, a partner at Reed Smith. Thank you, Larry, and thank you, Jerry, and the other leaders from the Unemployment Compensation Office. I think all of you are doing a tremendous job. I can confirm that those $600 a week federal supplement checks are coming in. Clients are telling me today that some of their employees that they had to lay off are receiving their first check, so that's outstanding and very much appreciated. And thank you to Mike for sharing your, your views on the furloughs and so on. I called my section for today going to work. Um, for 20 years, a big part of my identity has been going to work. In fact, more specifically, it's been going to the office. Uh, my wife and I have five children. My kids are used to hearing me say every morning, I'm going to the office now. Uh, lately, going to the office for me means coming down to the basement where I have a little corner set up down here. Usually my cat and dog come down with me. In fact, on a Zoom meeting earlier today, my cat joined me and perched on the shelf right behind me here. So that may happen again, who knows. There will come a point uh, uh, where for me going to work means again going to the office in downtown Pittsburgh and I'm anxious for that day to get here. This map that I'm showing you right now is showing you the statewide business closures across the US. Uh, the states that have some variation of a statewide business restriction are shown in red. There are only three states in the US that do not um, have some version of a statewide restriction. And if you know your geography, those three are South Dakota, Nebraska, and Arkansas shown here in, in white. But otherwise, all the other states have some variation or some definition of an essential business or life-sustaining business that is open with other businesses restricted or closed. And so we find ourselves in a situation where today, more than 16 million Americans are filing for unemployment as a direct result of COVID-19. Already you can hear at both the, the federal level and also the local and state level talk about how do we develop a strategy to safely reopen the economy, reopen businesses, and at some point start to return these Americans to work. Larry, can we look at the next slide, please? This little more colorful map is showing you with color coding the current time frame for these restrictions around the country. This could obviously change, but as of today, the states in red, which would include Pennsylvania, have statewide business restrictions in place through the end of this month. The states in yellow have restrict business restrictions in place through the end of May. The states in green have restrictions in place through June, and then in purple, there's no, no end currently, it's an indefinite restriction. And again, those, those, those uh, dates might change, but, but you can see why the thinking starts to turn now to how do we safely get people back into the workplace. And of course, for companies that are, that are deemed life-sustaining or essential businesses, they're sending their workers into the workplace every day right now. And, and that's gonna include you know, healthcare workers, transportation workers, manufacturing industry, there, there are many industries where people fortunately do still have work and are, and are going into the workplace every day. Larry, next slide, please. So the question then becomes, what, what can or what maybe what should employers be doing to try to keep the workplace safe because the virus isn't going to go away anytime soon. And we know from the medical experts that we're not gonna have a vaccine anytime soon, probably won't have a vaccine apparently until 2021. So what can, what can and should employers do? So there is some guidance from the EEOC, which is very helpful. And in a, nut, in a nutshell, what the EEOC and other agencies are telling us is that because this is a pandemic situation, 
it currently in, in, in this time, the employee's privacy interests are trumped by the employer's safety interests. So for example, employers can screen employees before permitting them into the workplace. That would mean today for the workers who are, who are uh, part of an essential business workforce, they can be screened before they go into their place of work every day today, or as frequently as the employer wants. And that screening could be in the form of a questionnaire or a certification where the employer is asking the employee to answer questions about their health, which outside of a pandemic would not be permitted, but not because this is a pandemic, it is permitted. We can ask employees, do you have COVID-19? Have you been diagnosed? Do you have symptoms of COVID-19? In fact, the EEOC has broadened the kinds of symptoms that we can ask about quite a bit to go even beyond symptoms that are recognized by the CDC. We can ask employees before they come into the workplace, have you had close contact with anyone else who's been diagnosed with COVID-19 or who has the symptoms of COVID-19? And we can do body temperature screenings. By the way, I used to think that the body temperature screenings, I was envisioning like thermometers in the mouths of employees as they waited in line to go into work. But actually there are very large infrared machines that can detect people's body temperatures just as they walk by. They're expensive, but they are available and some of my clients are purchasing those right now. Uh, we can also, once an employee has been screened, depending on their answers to the question, we can exclude them from the workplace. We can ask everyone those questions or we can do it on a case-by-case -case basis. If we're asking questions on a case-by-case -case basis, we have to have some reasonable basis for thinking that the employee that we're asking questions about might pose a threat in the workplace. So for example, if they have a really bad cough, then we might just focus on that one person. But, but outside of that, outside of having a reasonable basis to think that that one person poses a threat, it's not safe to ask just one person. That, that would look like we're singling them out for some reason. Thanks, Larry, for moving to the next slide. You read my mind. What, what are some things that we cannot do we can't try to screen employees who are working from home, like myself right now in my basement office here. It would, be, it would be unfair, potentially illegal to ask me questions about my health right now. I'm not posing a threat to anyone else because I'm not interacting with anyone else. And so, so people who are remote working or who are not physically present in the common workplace, they should not be screened. This is an interesting thing to keep in mind. We cannot ask employees about a family member's symptoms. That could potentially be a violation of federal law, the, the law called GINA, about genetic information. So we can ask about general, have you generally been exposed to anyone who might have COVID-19, but we can't really ask about family members or other people living in the home specifically. The EEOC has been crystal clear. We cannot disclose the identity by name of anyone who has COVID-19 or has symptoms of COVID-19, except for disclosing that to public health agencies. And I know that question comes up a lot from HR departments. We really want to tell coworkers, you know, who the individual is because that will help them make an informed decision about whether they had close contact. We can't give out that person's name. That'd be a violation of privacy interests. We can go to the next slide, Larry. We have to keep that, that medical information separate. That's, a, that's a, you know, probably the employers on this call are familiar with that obligation. That has to be confidential and maintained separately. The thing maybe to, to remember now is if you do set up a questionnaire, like we've set up for a lot of the clients that we work with, uh, that questionnaire has to be kept confidential in a separate file from the ordinary um, personnel file. We need to continue to accommodate workers in terms of a, a good faith interactive process. If they have some sort of impairment or disability, it may, there may be some underlying impairment, maybe even a mental impairment that it, where the symptoms are exacerbated because of COVID-19. So we have to continue to work with those workers on an individualized basis. We can move on to the next slide. One other thing here to keep in mind, there are a number of agencies that are coming out with some best practice guidances. This is just one example. This is from the FDA and it has to do with the food industry, but there, there are other similar guidances coming out. There are also many local governments, county governments in states that are coming out with specific requirements or expectations about the workplace itself. So this is an example from the FDA, some best practices for retail food stores, restaurants and other food, other, um, 
companies in the in the food industry. So we, we want the clients that we work with to be aware that there are other outside agencies and governmental entities that are that are pushing expectations about how you will maintain your workplace, things like keeping co keeping coworkers six feet apart, putting barriers up at, at cubicles. There are all kinds of different things happening. And of course the the issue about face masks or face coverings. In some local jurisdictions, that is now becoming required as a matter of local ordinance. Next slide, please. So that is not me, but that could that could be me, or maybe that could be some of you hanging out at home in your leopard print bathrobe today, working from home or currently unemployed. But soon there will be a day where we are all going back to work and the things that I've been talking about are the questions that will be on employers' minds. Thank you for your time. Thanks, uh, Jay, and thank you, Mike and Jay, for throwing some pictures into our presentations today. So right now we'll go to our question and answer period. Uh, thank you to those that have submitted uh, questions. Uh, if you have questions to submit, you are still more than welcome to do that, and we'll get to them in the order they're received. Uh, feel free to do that, uh, not in the chat bar, but in the Q&A uh, interface on your screen. Uh, so our first question comes from Brian, uh, and his question states, are there any minimum reduction in hour thresholds uh, that must be met for hourly wage employees to collect partial unemployment in a situation when hours have been reduced? Uh, and he gave the example of a 25% hour reduction. Uh, this is Jerry. Uh, Bill, I, I think you could uh, answer that pretty uh, effectively. Are you there, Bill? Well, the, the short answer is yes, they can apply. Um, if, if, if what we're telling folks is if, if they're in, in doubt, apply. If your uh, hours have been affected by COVID-19, uh, apply. And in the situation yeah. that uh, is being uh, discussed here, they would be eligible. I apologize. I had a couple mutes, I guess I had to unmute. Um, hourly. Hours don't necessarily matter. It's the amount of earnings. Right. Um, if someone if someone's receiving uh, unemployment compensation, she, they should get a letter of financial determination that will tell them how much they can make, where it won't affect their uh, regular unemployment benefits. Thank you, Secretary and Bill. Uh, this fall, this question is from Brian as well. Uh, are there any circumstances in which a salaried exempt employee uh, who's had their salary reduced can collect unemployment? If again, if it's, it's all related to earnings, if uh, they're earning money, they have to report it and that would affect their unemployment compensation claim. So yeah, even with a salary reduction, you know, there's a maximum benefit you can receive in Pennsylvania. That's five hundred and seventy-two dollars a week. That would all be based on our uh, the table we look at to determine your your weekly benefit amounts. Thanks, Bill. And our next question comes from Anna. Um, it's really related to sole proprietors. Um, and her question is: When will unemployment be available for self-employed sole proprietors? Um, and how do you see that calculation coming into play? That's the pandemic un um, unemployment assistance program, the PUA program. We again, hope to have that application up in on our site within the next couple of days. It will be very similar to regular unemployment as far as the amount that's determined. Uh, we will look at wages, the, and once again, the maximum you'll be able to receive is $572 a week, plus the $600 that's also available for FPUC. Awesome. Thanks, Bill. Um, our next question comes from Kevin, um, and the question is, if someone was only paid for a partial week, do they qualify for the additional $600? If they are collecting, yes, they would. Anybody that's collecting unemployment is eligible for the $600. Great, thanks, Bill. Uh, we'll move to some of our, our questions that have been asked in um, our platform. So this first question is uh, from Ellen, um, and it's related to the Pennsylvania unemployment statute. And the question is, does that cover foreign nationals? 
for and and I have Maria Macus on the phone, but I, I don't think she's a panelist, and I don't know how we can get to her. She's she's our unemployment compensation attorney. I will have to. That's a question I do not know the answer to. Um, are they they are working in PA? I assume. Uh, and I know yes. it's a. Okay, I don't. Uh, you know, as as long as they have and they have their work visa, that that's an issue that we've been seeing. If if folks have don't have their work visa, it they haven't. We we're trying to figure out a way to extend people's work visas uh, as well as allow them to collect unemployment. That would be a case by case basis. We'd have to make sure, um, you know, they they pass the social security checks. Um, I can look into that a little more for you and get back to you. Yeah, and Bill, we'll be sure to get you Ellen's contact information. That that shouldn't be too hard. Um, yeah, that that's perfect. We'll we'll return this around pretty quickly for you. Awesome. So, Ellen, if you're on the line, we'll get that to you. Uh, our next question comes from Lauren, um, and the question is: Is can EPSL be intermittent? If someone receives a partial benefit for symptoms related to COVID uh, nineteen, but tests negative. And then later is diagnosed with uh, with COVID nineteen a second time. Uh, hey, Larry. So this is Mike Pavlik. Um, uh, I, 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 I'll take that one. Um, uh, it is it, EPSL is not um, intermittent. Um, although I'm not sure that really is intermittent leave. What the questioner is describing. It seems that there's a uh, a, a a diagnosis a collection and then a, a, a re a reinfection or a or a re a, a new need for the leave. And so in that from that standpoint there can be uh, the leave can be broken up. You have one qualifying event, there's one qualifying condition, um, and then it goes away. Uh, and then you can get uh, additional leave for the new qualifying condition. Thanks Mike. Um, our next question comes from Maria Maria has a two-person company, and they are a corporation, and both employees are paid by W-2. Uh, can, can she collect that employment compensation if she owns 100% of the company? Um, it's a real estate business, so it's shut down by the uh, non-essential order that the governor has issued. She would be eligible for the PUA program, the Pandemic Unassistance, uh, Unemployment Assistance Program. Great, thanks for that. Um, we'll move on to our next question. Um, and the question is, uh, uh, an employer had a pregnant uh, CSR that could work remote um, and, and it had to lay that person off to prevent early exposure. Um, and their question is sort of uh, the process around whether or not that, uh, that was a, 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 good, a, a good thing to do, what you would recommend. I'm um, just seeking your perspective on that. Larry, who, that, that, who, that, is yeah. that for unemployment? Yeah, I'm, I'm unclear who, who you're directing that to. Yeah. I it, would think that's for one of the uh, employment experts. Yeah. Yeah. So, so this is Mike Pavlik and Jay, feel free to, uh, feel free to jump in. Um, I, I mean, typically under those circumstances, um, uh, and I'm assuming that the employee was not a willing uh, participant to the layoff. Um, if the employee was asking for the layoff, that's, that's fine. If the employee wasn't asking for the layoff, um, I think typically that would be um, a potential violation uh, of federal law. Um, uh, however, uh, because it is being viewed as a direct threat, in other words, the pandemic, the EEOC thinks that that the pandemic is a direct threat. Um, that sort of extreme action in order to protect the safety of uh, employees uh, is being permitted um, and I think would have been permitted under the circumstances described. It, this is Jay. Yeah, I totally agree with you, Mike. I, I just want to add to that the EEOC had a webinar a couple of weeks ago and the transcript of the webinar is available on the EEOC's website. I can, I'd be happy to email the link to anybody who wants to see it. 
prior to the webinar, the EEOC asked for questions that they could answer during the webinar. I submitted a lot of questions along these lines. Basically, would it be safe for employers to proactively take action, um, kind of focus on the populations who the CDC would say are at risk because of COVID-19? The EEOC did not specifically answer those questions, but based on the content from that webinar, I agree with what Mike is saying. I, I think the EEOC would not look favorably on that, would, would tend to view that as that proactive approach might be taken in good faith, but it could be viewed as discrimination. Having said that, I think because this is a pandemic and because of the direct threat posed by COVID-19, to me, it feels unlikely for that sort of thing to result in a claim or a finding of liability. Having, you know, again, just, we just really have to be careful unless you're taking action based on someone's actual medical condition that they report to you. Yeah, and I should provide a little more information. They said that the employee was, um, was more than willing because of the, the potential risks. So um, just wanted to be sure to provide a little more, for, more from that question. Um, this question is really directed at um, really any one of our panelists. Um, it, it's around the projection of furloughed employees and how many we could see in Pennsylvania and what we see the projected numbers being. In. And so maybe we can ask our folks at the Department of Labor for, for their thoughts on the trajectory or the trajectory of uh, furloughed employees in the state overall. Well, I know we will uh, have figures to release uh, this Friday that will include just the early part of March. Uh, we expect to see an increase in the uh, rate of unemployment, uh, both nationally and within Pennsylvania. I, I can't say what they are, that will be yet, but even that won't indicate, um, you know, most of that is pre-mitigation efforts as this was uh, developing. Uh, I, I wish I could predict that. I know uh, uh, the governor is already beginning, a, has created a, a task force to look at uh, the path forward, what, what it's going to look like when we start to come out of this and what we need to do to be ready as we're coming out of this. But to, to project what unemployment will be, um, I, I just, I, I wouldn't, couldn't begin to say unless, Bill, you have something to add. No, other than, you know, we can tell you we had 1.4 million claims after today and when the PUA program goes live, we're, we're expecting at least a half a million additional claims. Yeah, thank you, Jerry and Bill. And as it relates to the, to the information you said is gonna be released Friday, as we mentioned on our webinar, uh, the Allegheny Conference has put together a, a pretty comprehensive website and we'll uh, reference that again, but it's alleghenyconference.org backslash COVID-19. We'll be sure to put that, that information that the secretary mentioned uh, being released Friday. Larry, Larry excuse me, if I could uh, add to that, uh, that's yeah. also, that will also be on our website uh, when that is released. And uh, since you were mentioning websites, <clears throat> uc.pa.gov, um, that's the unemployment compensation um, website. There's a, a series of um, links there to frequently asked questions. So if we don't get to questions today, I would encourage people to go to that link uh, there are uh, questions specifically related to COVID-19 and just unemployment in general. Uh, we're constantly updating that, and um, that, that would be a, a great source. And also for uh, business owners, uh, dced.pa.gov. DCED is the Department of uh, Community and Economic Development. Uh, and there's uh, information there for uh, small businesses, how to get loans, and also for resources for uh, people who are concerned about um, making ends meet during all this that are having trouble with um, credit card bills or utility bills and things like that. So there's a lot of resources on those two uh, websites that can, can help folks. Definitely. And uh, we will be sure to add that information in our website. So if you, if you need it, you should definitely check out the, the secretary site because they are putting together a lot of important and pertinent information. Um, so thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, our next question comes from Terry. Um, Terry's asking um, if unemployment is going to be available for independent contractors. And Terry gave the example of an, uh, a psychologist who works for senior programs, um, which they're not allowed to, to visit the senior center. So what does that look like? Yes, once again, that's part of the PUA program. Um, I'll, and I'll sum that up. It's generally anyone who earned wages 
in Pennsylvania that uh, wouldn't be eligible for traditional unemployment compensation benefits will more than likely be eligible for the PUA program. That's the self-employed independent contractors, folks who didn't have enough earnings to qualify. As said before, the PUA program is, is unemployment on steroids. Okay, and Bill, just to, to add to that, is PUA, the website's gonna be available 24 uh, seven, like the unemployment compensation application? We had a question there related to that too. Yes, it, it will be, it'll, yes. Okay. I, I believe it's going to be uc.pa.gov backslash uh, PUA program. Let's see, there it is, you heard it. You're first. <laughs> You're first, yeah. <laughs> um, our, our next question comes from James, and it's around the salary reductions. Um, and the, the question is, why do those salary reductions need to be short term? You admit, one of you had mentioned that earlier. Uh, yeah, this is Mike Pavlik. Um, they don't need to be short term. As a matter of fact, I'm suggesting that they not be short term. Um, uh, let me explain why that's the case. Um, uh, so when we talk about salary reductions, I'm assuming we're talking about salaried exempt employees. Uh, and in order to claim the exemption, um, those employees um, have to meet three tests, a duties test, uh, a minimum salary requirement, uh, and a um, a uh, 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 what we call salary basis requirement. Um, and salary basis basically means that you get paid um, the same amount um, uh, regardless, uh, week to week, um, regardless of the quantity or quality of the work. And there are all kinds of exceptions to that, but that's the basic idea behind the salary basis test. Um, the Department of Labor and courts have held uh, that with respect to these, um, these short-term reductions in salary to respond to short-term business needs, that those are impermissible reductions in salary. And when I say impermissible, you can do it. There's no problem with you doing it. The problem is, is that you then convert your exempt employee into a non-exempt employee and all the savings you might have realized from reducing a salary could be lost when you now have to pay this employee overtime for hours that work, hours that are worked in excess of 40. Um, so the suggestion is, it's not a requirement again, but the suggestion is, is that these, is that these salary reductions, um, number one, be prospective, uh, occur, you know, say, listen, it's going to happen beginning next week. Um, and it's going to be for an indefinite period. We're not sure how long this is going to last. Um, it's to respond to longer term business needs. It's not a short term forecast. In other words, we're not saying, yeah, you know what, this is a little bit slow right now. So in two weeks, we'll reevaluate. Um, that would probably be an impermissible deduction. A more permissible deduction or a permissible deduction would be, we're not sure where this is headed. This is going to take some time. And, uh, and while we're navigating COVID-19, we're going to reduce salaries. Um, so I hope that answers the question. Um, uh, but the, but the short answer is, is, uh, is it's advisable, um, to, to make sure that these are longer term, that they're not a, a, a response to a very short term business need. Thank you for that, Mike. Uh, I want to remind everybody that we will have access to this webinar on our website. So if we didn't get to your question or you want to look at information that's related to the slides that our presenters uh, offered today, that will be uh, available. And James, who asked that question, wanted Mike to know that uh, the, it did answer his question. So that's, that's really good to hear. Um, one thing, and maybe the, um, the, the Department of Labor will be able to talk a little bit about, or, or even Mike or Jay, is sort of the assistance that you foresee being available to nonprofits um, and, and sort of when that assistance is gonna be. And I'm not sure um, specifically, but one of our, our questioners is interested in hearing a little bit about that, if there's any information. Larry, I can take that. That's the 50% uh, reimbursable employer question. Uh, we are, that's the last piece of guidance we are waiting for, for, for from our friends at the Department of Labor. Um, as soon as we have that guidance, we will be letting folks know who who that applies to. But it looks like the 50% uh, 
uh, reduction or f uh, will apply to nonprofits, religious organizations, and government entities. Uh, again, the last thing we're waiting for guidance from is 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 that piece of the CARES Act. And I unfortunately am going to have to jump off. If Larry, if you could provide any UC questions to me, uh, we'll turn those around by the end of the week for you and get back to you. But I appreciate this opportunity. No, and thank you for, for joining us, Bill. And we want to be mindful of all of our panelists' time, uh, so we will be sure to get you that information. Um, and, uh, and and thank you for joining us. So this concludes the Q and A portion of our presentation today. Um, as a reminder, uh, thank you so much to our panelists for all their work. Uh, for more information on what the Allegheny Conference is doing and access to this webinar, please feel free to visit us at www.alleghenyconference.org backslash COVID-19 to receive more information on our presentation today and hear about sort of what we have been doing as it relates to COVID-19. Um, I'd like to thank really all of our participants in today's webinar. A real particular note of appreciation to, for our continued partnership with the Pennsylvania Department of Labor and Industry. We had Jerry and Bill on the line. K&L Gates and, and Reed Smith, Jay and Mike, thank you so much for joining us. In these unprecedented times, it's so crucial that we work together with our partners at, the, at both the public and private level. Uh, and the information provided by our partners here today is very helpful. So thank you for taking the time to join us and giving us such an up-to-date um, look at what's happening in our world today. So we look forward to working with you. Please look forward to look for our website. Um, and we'd like to thank our sponsors, Peoples, Giant Eagle, Highmark, and UPMC Health Plan for their generous support, which allows us to have this conversation today. Please be on the lookout for more information and an invitation to join our next webinar in the Response and Recovery Series. Thank you and have a great day.